Thank you. And we're well aware this is the last session, so we want to make it a little fun, worth your while to stay, and we hope that you stay. So real quick, um, I'm from yesterday, and Marta is from last year. So we're happy presented last year, so you're back. <laughs> so my role, real quick, is basically create the analysis, facilitate analysis, and Marta's role leading to this presentation was reporting and actually determining metrics and useful metrics. And now Marta's moving on to ERM. And, uh, to consume those metrics. To consume those <laughs> metrics. <laughs> so bottom line on our presentation, we're going to kind of tag team a bit on the slides. We worked it out. But we're going to say, you know, you have your fair analysis. Now, now what? Right? We're going to say, let's use it right, to actually then create or discover metrics that will be useful and indicate risk. And we're, we have a fraud scenario analysis we're going to use. So it's kind of using a, a cookbook approach, a cooking show approach. I'll, I'll explain that a bit later. So let's see if we're working here. So do your metrics indicate risk? So our first main question, we're not going to ask you that question yet. We're just going to ask who uses metrics or who has anything to do with metrics at any, any time, any place, not even at work, but do you use a metric in some way? So it seems like most everybody. So we're going to move on then to the risk part. And this should be familiar, I think, to most people. Who, who has seen this before in the room? I know, I know Jack showed something yesterday. It had a little less bullets. And none of them were risk, I think, yesterday. So who, who in the room has actually uh, presented this and actually gone through an exercise with a group? Someone? Anyone else? I, Okay, so you, you understand and you actually are able to use it. Um, and I think, I think, you know, you might probably have an idea of the answer if you've gone through it. Um, I know there are some people new to FAIR. The, the way to look at it would be is what can be measured, right? What up there is actually measurable in terms of the definition of risk that we use, right? Frequent, probable frequency, probable magnitude of future loss related to events. So. Another way to vet things out is to look at which ones might be control deficiencies. They might all be control deficiencies. I don't know. There's usually a lot, right? So do you see some control deficiencies up there? I think there are a few. Um, probably not patching. What about threats? Yep, some insiders that aren't happy. Uh, assets, right? Wireless access points. Outcomes. Okay, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of a subject of discussion, right? Maybe, you know, reputation. Sometimes people say reputation, R word. So others don't like that at all. But it's a matter of your perspective. But I, I would argue against it. Regulatory compliance would be probably an, an objective or requirement. And so it's hopefully a little easier than a needle in the haystack. But what we're going to do today is take this legacy or classic exercise and instead of Where's the risk? We're going to do where's the risk indicator. <laughs> that was good. Oh, man. Okay. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marta. I didn't even know you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where's the risk indicator? As part of managing a metrics program, uh, I put together a lot of numbers, some of them more meaningful than others. Um, if you look at all of these numbers on the screen, some of them might be more useful than others, also depending on who's consuming them. Now, I'm not saying that all of these things should not be reported on, but um, there, there's this tendency to use interchangeably metrics and risk indicators, and that's kind of one of the points that we want to make here, that if you're choosing a risk indicator, it needs to be something that is somewhat related to risk. If it's not related to risk, it might be speaking to um, how well you're managing your security program, and it might be a very valid metric, but it absolutely is not a key risk indicator. Um, so similar to the previous exercise, we wanted to try to go through, through these nine options, and Steve, can you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we wanted to go through these and, and see which ones are performance or controls or compliance indicators, and then which ones our risk, and we have a little issue there, but if it's a risk indicator, it should somewhat be related to loss exposure, at least if you're talking in fair terms, right? I mean, yeah, if you're talking to someone who doesn't exposure. think like that. Yes. 
Yeah. So if you go through, if you look at the list that we have on the screen, right, how many, I don't know, can, can you spot, can someone spot one that is a performance indicator for me? Man, there was not enough coffee in that coffee break. <laughs> someone, a couple? Sorry. Yeah, that, that would be a service performance indicator, right? Like you're pen testing, are you doing it quick? Now, I don't think that's related in any form or fashion to what happens when the shit hits the fan. So um, I don't see that. Control or compliance, an easy compliance one if the policies are knowledge, right? That's, that's a basic that is also not related to risk. Now, which of this would you think are related to risk? Would you pick any? Do you like any of them? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Records breached? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I'm not saying that I have a definite answer, but I would agree with that because it would be a way, it would be related to your loss in a particular event, right? Any other one? $100. Yep, yeah. <laughs> Incident response cost, and it's not because it's dollars, <laughs> but it's because it, it's part of your uh, probable loss magnitude, right? So uh, the thing, though, is that when you're, most security programs, when you're reporting um, on all of these metrics mix, and you're trying to depict what's your risk profile, uh, but we are actually reporting all of these things at the same time to folks that are not really security savvy or even technology savvy for that matter. And I can probably imagine it feels somewhat similar to being in Times Square and not looking where to, not knowing what to look at. You know, it's like all of these slides and which one is relevant and what the heck do they mean? So uh, moving on to the next. Sure. Uh, again, it, it says, does it affect loss exposure? Times Square is. So many false indicators, I guess it's overwhelming the definition. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so metrics. Why, why, right? So yesterday we had a panel on regulators asking for, for metrics. I think auditors may ask for them as well in some shape or form. And we may do them for those reasons. But again, as Marta was saying, they may not be risk indicators. They may be indicating something else but at least maybe they indicate that you can pass the audit or something like that, right? So now, who says we need them for real? So let's talk about that a bit. And yeah, and, and one of the topics that we kept hearing throughout yesterday and today is how uh, you're trying to enable decisions. And um, those, that executive leadership and those decision makers that are not technology folks do need to know how to stir that ship. So, we always try to keep that into account and keep in mind that, that you're trying to help them figure out what's the best course of action and then also help them figure out when should they be reconsidering those decisions that they made and when do they need to course correct. It's not only about making a decision once but going back to the framework, right? You want them to be able to adjust the, their behaviors and, and adjust their decisions if necessary. And so, the overall point of, um, Steve, if you can move on to the next one, the overall sure. point of having KRIs and looking at KRIs is that even after you've made your risk analysis once and um, after you've made a decision to take a particular action, you want to be able to tell if that decision worked the way it was supposed to work and control your execution. But not only that, if the environment changes, you might want to have to make new decisions, right? And uh, even though, going back to that panel, a lot of frameworks say that you should be analyzing risk over and over again, we all know that's not doable. You can't be running simulations every day. That's not practical and not useful. And that's what KRI should be helping you do. They should be helping you figure out if anything has significantly changed since the last time you made a decision, for good and for bad. Okay, so again, we alluded to risk earlier with the uh, where's the risk, but just to confirm, uh, this is our definition because we're going to use it as a foundation. And again, that's the uh, framework we use there about risk as being an overall picture, right? It's not, it's not lack of a control working properly. It's, of course, these other components, and that's fundamental. And we're going to build a definition of a key risk indicator using that definition of risk, and we go kind of our typical look up the dictionary exercise. What's an indicator? 
What's key mean? So this is one way of looking at it, but it's actually building upon our risk definition. And moving along, yep. we are going to our the case study. <laughs> Did I skip no, it? No, not case study. Oh, it's after. Oh, it's after. Okay, so now Marta's <laughs> turn. Got it. So if a key risk indicator is uh, something that can affect risk, where we started when we built this was the risk indicator should be a risk factor. If it's relevant to loss exposure, it should be part of your risk analysis. If it's not part of your risk analysis, is it really saying anything about your loss exposure changing? So um, imagine if you had a, a little dial and you could change each of these inputs, you would, in effect, see um, Steve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would see the, the loss exposure changing accordingly. So the way we approached the problem was, OK, then by looking at all of these factors, once I have already made a decision and I'm already doing something about it, by looking at the factors, I should be able to tell approximately if the loss exposure is changing a lot. If the factors remain the same, the risk is the same, right? The second part to the definition, which is in the next slide, is um, between a risk indicator and a key risk indicator, right? If you look at the, uh, at the terms that are part of a fair analysis, like you have a lot of factors. If you had to report on all of those for all of your risk statements, that's just, again, overwhelming amount of information. So how do you distinguish between one that is more relevant than the other? And the beauty of it is that not all factors are equal. In each scenario, there's going to be factors that have a huge impact in your loss exposure, and there's going to be factors that don't. And that depends on each specific analysis and the inputs that you put in. And so uh, you would only want to report on the ones that, that have a relevant effect on the outcome. If you look at the first chart, you will see that loss exposure, which is the gray line, stays relatively the same while the blue line is going up and down like crazy. Whereas the one at the bottom, when the orange risk factor is changing a little bit, loss exposure does have a relevant variation with it, right? So you want to find those factors that have a little bit stronger correlation given your specific posture. And those are the ones that you actually put in the report. So uh, this is all a lot of theory. <laughs> but uh, we want to illustrate it with how, how do you actually get to do this, right? Because those charts were pretty fancy, but we're all garbage data. All right, so now to some numbers. <laughs> <laughs> 3 p.m., here we go. So this is our case study, and we're taking, if Chip Block is still here, he gave me the, he gave me the idea this morning about, you know, how you watch a, anyone a fan of a cooking show when, you know, they really annoy you, right? Because they, it looks so easy because everything's pre-measured, everything's all ready to go, and... They, they combine the ingredients and they turn around and, and they pull it out of the oven, right? So we're kind of doing this now, so bear with us. We have a cooking, we have it cooked up already, the, the study here. So we have the numbers. So obviously there's a lot of, uh, that goes into getting these ranges, right? There's calibration of your, of your uh, sources. But we're looking at a scenario here where it's a, it's a, it's a very high threat of infrequency. And... There is some vulnerability there. So you know, what we're saying is most likely 15% right, you know, will be overcome and turn into loss events. And there is, on the loss magnitude side, there's replacement costs and person hours, which goes into response costs. But we broke it down even lower for the illustration. And there is some secondary uh, risk there. Uh, and it's got a whopper you know, if it hits. So that's part of the equation. And that's part of the beauty of fares that you can have that in, in, in the model. So we've run the numbers, and I'm going to take you inside the oven real quick while it's baking. So at least we're going to show you inside the oven. And this is an example I've used for a couple years now, and I use this at the chapter meetings just to show kind of what's happening, right, in the cooker. So, and uh, do, uh, Lamb, uh, Dr. Lamb, Mr. Lamb, this morning, we talked about risk being a, a bell curve or a distribution. So we've actually got risk factors being uh, distributions here, right? So you've got loss of infrequency, it's something that's more in the center. Primary loss magnitude is, uh, you know, it's always going to be kind of the same high, you know, relatively amount here. And your secondary loss of infrequency is, is there as such. So again, these aren't exact, but we're illustrating what's going on. So when you run the Monte Carlo, you're actually picking. You pick from all the distributions that are the factors of risk, and you, you do the frequency times magnitude roughly, but there's a little more in the relationships. And you have a simulated loss exposure. 
So you do it again, and you don't want to do this manually. You can maybe do it once or twice, then you get sick of it, and you want something to run fast, and here we go. And we get up to our 3,000, and we are done. Oh, we're so done, I went to the next slide. <laughs> but they're done. <laughs> so there you go, and, there, and there's your histogram that's putting the buckets of the outcomes, and that is what we use to then perform our analysis, right, and take our percentages for, uh, and it, this can also be translated into the loss exceedance curve that Mr. Lamb talked about earlier today. But for purposes of today, we're gonna stick with the, uh, the histogram view. So going to the next slide, we've got the actual kind of an output from a tool. In this case, it's wrist lens, and that's the histogram, and we've got our primary forms of loss on the top uh, on some bar charts, and we've got our secondary forms of loss there on the bottom mapped out. And what we're going to talk about now is the most likely value there. Right now, it's at 4.5 million, so Marty's going to walk you through the thinking of you know, how do we bounce things off that and see what matters more as, as far as a meaningful uh, metric. So remember that 4.5 million number there. And I'm going to get to the next slide. And I'll turn it over to Marta. Yeah, actually, I think. Next slide? Okay. So no, there's yeah, you can click through next all slide? of it. So in order to find, once you have completed your risk analysis, in order to find which of the factors are more relevant than the others, what we do is we change one of the inputs, only one, and then we observe the outcome and how has the outcome changed. And if you do this process with each of your inputs, you can then compare how each of them affect the output. And I'm telling you, it's not the same. So, uh, and so that you not only have my words to speak to it, um, we have a couple of examples here for the case study. I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure no one can read this, so, but I heard the slides are going to be available. <laughs> so, um, baseline? Yeah, baseline example, which Steve just walked you through. And then we take thread event frequency and increase it by 10%. And once we do that, uh, the most likely has gone up from a 4.5 million to a 5.7 million. So it's uh, kind of 20 percentage. I should have done this math before. It's definitely not linear. It's, it's not only a 10% addition. Now, if you look at another factor, for instance, the replacement cost, and you increase that in 10%, your most likely is four. Actually, because of the number of times it run, it's not even statistically significant. It's, it's coming out with a lower most likely than the baseline. And, um, and you in, if you increase the secondary loss event frequency, pardon my non-fair jargon on the slide, right. um, it has a similar effect. So out of the three, if you want to click one more time, Steve, the thread event frequency has a larger impact than the other two by making the same variation to the input. Now, you could do this manually, but if you want to get sophisticated and you have a bunch of factors and you actually want to try different variations, because a 5%, a 10 and a 20% is not always the same, um, the tools, thankfully, are now keeping Catching up, up and um, support what yeah. is called uh, sensitivity analysis or a stress test. And I don't know if anyone has heard this term before. If you have colleagues that work in credit risk, you probably have heard stress test, and this is what they're referring to. That process that we said of changing each of the variables a little bit and uh, see the output, that's, uh, that's what they do over and over again a bunch of times. And um, so I'm going to try to walk you through how you read these results, although it's going to be kind of difficult without you seeing it. But um, what you get is for each of your inputs, what if you move it at 20%, 10%, 5% or 1%, positively and negatively. Because mm -hmm. remember, you might want to look at which things, if you were in a, in a good risk position for a particular thread, um, you might want to look at my, what might push you over your tolerance line, but you also might want to look at how much you want to go back and reduce your current loss exposure, right? So um, for instance, in this example, well, can you go back to the other two rounds? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> So for instance, the way you read these results, an increase of a 5% in thread activity would be equivalent to an increase in 20% of replacement costs, given this current scenario. Or if you want to look at the uh, positive side of it, if you decreased, um, if you decreased um, your vulnerability in a 1%, 
you would reduce your risk posture in the same amount as by responding 10% quicker. So sometimes this is eye-opening in terms of what is the best way of, what is the best strategy to reduce a particular risk, right? Because I don't know how much effort is involved in being 1% less vulnerable, but you could compare that to how much effort is involved in being 10% faster. And um, that's kind of how you would bake it. At the end of the day, if you go to the next slide, once you look at all of these results, the real question is which of the factors could put you above your tolerance line? And those are the ones that you want to report on. So if there's a table actually that you probably won't be able to read either, but um, by looking at all of the results, you can see which ones have a resulting loss exposure that is unacceptable for you, right? Mm -hmm. And those are the ones you want to report on. The other ones, given your current situation, are not as relevant. And that enables you to kind of keep an eye on it without necessarily being um, assessing risk every month on each scenario. It also allows you to establish a tolerance threshold, if you think about it. Because if you compare, in this particular example, threat event frequency only will push you above your tolerance if it changes more than 20%. But vulnerability will push you up above if it decreases by 10%. So you're less tolerant to changes in your vulnerability compared to tolerance to changes in the threat event frequency which is actually good because you can control vulnerability and not so much. <laughs> but, um, so that's the idea. Wow, we did it really fast. We'll have, we, yeah, good, because so I'm we're sure recap. everyone wants to go home. Any, any, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have time for questions. Um, so again, we wanted to, us to uh, you know, use key risk indicators kind of by that definition we came up with, right? To actually indicate risk as we see it and, you know, in fair, in, in fair and as, uh, as a natural way, we think, to look at risk as uh, something you can measure, right? Frequency, magnitude, events, and they should be related to loss exposure because ultimately we're using our simulations, right, to combine all of the factors into a loss exposure that we do analysis on and because it's kind of like, you know, once you, once you do the analysis, there's more to, there's more to go. So we're, we're trying to say that maybe you have a good cook, but now it's time to get someone that's a good, you know, take her up to the next level and, and, and use it, right? Use it to uh, course adjustments, as Marta said. Use it for, you know, maintaining that, that, mod, that, that setup that you wanted to do of the way you wanted to have your enterprise run. Uh, and not all factors have the same uh, lever on loss exposure, as Marta was saying. Some, some can move a bit and have a big effect. Some can move a lot and they don't have an effect. So it may not be the best thing to worry about when you see something maybe drastically change because it may not be having the effect on actual risk. And a sensitivity analysis can help. So again, we ask the same question. So something maybe to think about on the way home. Um, you know, do your KRIs that you're using today indicate risk? Hopefully we gave you uh, a method to uh, maybe think about developing some, some, some other ones or vetting some out that, you know, maybe you just aren't as useful. And with that, I think we had a couple fun slides. So yeah, don't take this train on the way home. There's, there's definitely some risks there, we think. Uh, we, we definitely analyzed it. And uh, what else? And this, something weird happened in this photo. We just thought we'd show it for fun. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, a guy from Nysaka gave it to me. He said, use it as you want. And then this one here is, have a great day. And uh, thanks for, thanks for, for uh, giving us the attention. <laughs> so any questions? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so a real quick question, you were talking about the, uh, the sensitivity analysis and the controls moving the levers in different ways, and one of the things that we've been looking at, and I'm curious to see what, what your take on it was, um, there are those situations where a change in a control can affect multiple risks in a small way as opposed to one risk in a large way. How are you guys accounting for that where it could have that sort of uh, aggregate effect, and, and while if you looked at a particular risk, you wouldn't consider it one of your KRIs, but when you look across your, your whole sort of risk landscape, now it does become a care. Mm -hmm. uh, we formally aren't. We take that, we really don't um, apply this very religiously yet 
So uh, this is more of an idea that we have showcasted with one or two analysis, but um, but I we know that's a. Uh, well, I know as, as Mr. Lamb was talking about earlier today, right? You have to understand correlations, and uh, we fully recognize the problem. But we think with the sensitivity analysis, we're planning to use it a lot more and actually aggregate together scenarios, right? And you and we we yeah you know, we have actually aggregated things together and got kind of a total loss exposure maybe across about six or seven. But uh, yeah, the work would be then to go in and dive in a bit and understand, like you said, something small here could, could, could lever across many or it could be the opposite maybe. So no, I think it's a great topic for future uh, you know, research presentations. I think, you know, we think that's where everyone's gonna go. Next, yes. Hi, similar question to the last one. In fact, I was going to ask that last one, but I'll, <laughs> I'll ask um, a related one, which is you're kind of working backwards. So you've got your scenario, you've done the analysis, you've got the distribution, and then you're running sensitivity to see which variables have the biggest impact. And that, that makes total sense. What about if you haven't got the scenarios yet, but you've got a bunch of raw data? Have you looked into or do you think there's any potential for using some of the raw data you have to kind of triage, you know how you have that triage thing, you say here's our, our list of 10 biggest concerns and then we'll do a proper analysis on each of them. Mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of raw data on, I don't know, incidents, underlying problems, whatever it is, you say okay, here's where we're going to run an analysis. And so you use the, uh, the metrics as, um, as prompts for the quantification rather than the other as way around. As a premise to decide what to quantify? Yeah. Oh. I, I think the raw data in this case could be, are you talking about like audit findings or, or, or incidents or so, um, all the above? Could be anything. So yeah. in, my, in, in my situation, I'm looking at, I've been asked to come up with KRI specifically for what we call technology risk. So this is really the technology operations side of mm -hmm. risk, you know, failed changes, that kind of, hardware failures, that kind of thing as opposed to the, the cyber stuff. Um, we have a bunch of data, and I have some ideas, by the way, around using problem management, treating right. pro underlying problems that we already know about from past incidents as a kind of a proxy for the threat landscape. I would map, I mean, I, I think, you know, this can be done qualitatively in the sense that all those things you're referencing can be mapped to, to a scenario or to a threat community or an event, as we mentioned before. So I think, I think after doing that sort of an exercise, I mean, there could be some degree of inspection that can pro probably vet out some of the things to watch. And then maybe this sort of an exercise could help prove it, you know, more quantitatively in dollars. But I, but I think, I, you know, I've, I've always found that very useful, is if you kind of don't know what to do with some kind of data, you know, map, map it up to a scenario or, or, of sorts, and try not to have too many scenarios. Right, just try to have some good, well-defined, you know, risk register, as it were, you know, and, and have it kind of normalized. And I think, I think that should help you. But if not, you know, we can keep in touch. I'd be, I'd be interested. Hi. Um, for the uh, sensitivity analysis, how do you go about choosing which element you're going to adjust and by how much? Is there a methodology to that? Um, well, we just use the, what the tool offers. That's the risk lens does from a minus 20% to a plus 20%. And I think it does one, five, 10. But um, ideally, if you want to get very sophisticated, and that we've done this, um, you could do that based on the volatility of your variables. Because not necessarily, I mean, you can make an argument that not everything varies as much. Why do I keep using this word that I can't pronounce, Steve? Um, but you, you could use, if you are already measuring some of these things, some of your inputs for your risk analysis, you could look at how they have trended over time and see how much was the normal variation. What's kind of your normal changes there and, and go a little bit wider than that. But there, there is, I would always say there is some judgment, you know, pick. and it, it, it kind of go, it kind of aligns with when you're actually looking for risk reduction options to, to pick, right? So you just sometimes you know of an option that's out there, and, and you kind of see what kind of effect that might have on the, the uh, risk factors. So uh, 
I would, I would think along those lines. But the tool, you know, makes it, it's going to make it a lot easier. And, you know, we hope to see a lot more advancement in the tools. It's basically a brute force is what the tool's doing. It just brute forces it, and then you sort it, and then you can analyze that data set and uh, move on. So, again, we don't want to have to do all the, the detail work. <laughs> Thanks. How are we doing? Great. As you said, 15 minutes a while ago. So we're Would good. you mind going back to the Monte Carlo illustration slide and oh. spending a couple more minutes about um, just walking through that just to help us understand? The, uh, you mean the oven? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Back to the oven. Okay. And then the tool that you're referring to, which one is this? This tool? Yeah. Oh, th this is a uh, this is called a summer intern, <laughs> and in PowerPoint animation. <laughs> So, uh, so no, this, this is, um, yeah, no, I hope you like it. I mean, it's, uh, I, uh, it's just, it's just, it's visualizing what's happening with when you, when you run Monte Carlo. So you're actually, when you actually set up factors and ranges, so every, when you, when you set it up to do the fair analysis, you're actually picking uh, a min, a max, right? And you're picking some type of a curve and that's usually through a confidence type uh, selection. So if you're higher, the higher confidence, you're going to get a more pronounced peak in, in, the, in the curve. And if you're lower confidence, you're not so sure, so you have to have the Monte Carlo engine grab from you know, more of the broad range. So when you're higher confident, you're, you're going to pick more right, right in your most likely uh, spot there, so it's higher. So, and this is illustrating that different inputs can have different uh, confidences and ranges and, and whatnot. So, yeah, but in the end, it's, it, it is, a, you know, it's basically a frequency times magnitude in the end, ultimately. But it allows you to actually then keep track and then you re repackage it. I mean, then you group it again into the histogram. So, does that help? It's, yeah, I know it's fun. I know it's, it's I think I'm, <laughs> I'm always talking to Jack. I'm always saying, Jack, how do you explain fair really quick to someone? You know, I think, I think that's the new art form is, you know, I can get, I could get someone to, 20 minutes, you know, or something. I think, I think Jack has something now with race cars. So I'm, I'm going to try this for a while. I don't know. But this is probably more like the how, and Jack's is kind of more of the, you know, why. why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's another question there. Jim Robert, Fidelity Investments. In the last 10 minutes of listening to the KRI topic, you've got me thinking um, a little bit differently about KRIs. And it's like I'm the, it's the chicken and the egg thing. Um, so I'm on a journey on a quest with my team to identify our KRIs and you've now got me thinking is it the chicken and the egg where I should be thinking of identify the risk scenarios and then talk about KRIs related to them? I would, one of the things that you can do is same as when you're trying to analyze risk, you, you don't need to start all the way at the bottom of, you know, with the most level of detail in your inputs. So. Um, I would advise, in case of doubt, you can always get to how frequently does this happen and what's the impact. And then from there, start diving. That should allow you to that first triage. And actually, I should have thought about that when you asked your other question, that's sorry. Why. But wow. um, that's probably how I would approach that. Like, if you look at the things that you're experiencing, um, or that you could experience, but I mean, most likely, the ones that you are experiencing should be your first concern. How big are they? Do that first triage based on that very basic only two variables, and then pick which ones you want to go more in depth and keep track of. That's. It may not be the most convenient variables, but you know, in the end, it's probably worth it. We would hope. Then, then, then just measures, then just measuring something that's easy to measure and it's not not as useful. So that's, that's kind of our, that's our premise. Okay. All right. Looks hey, like we managed to do it. And a little there's the same quicker. amount of people here as when we started. So yay! That was my that was my metric. <laughs> that was my metric. <laughs> Good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.